Hello. Oh, Hi, good good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Ali Toomey, and I am the Education and Digital Coordinator for Earth Echo International. Um, this is our virtual field trip exploring hydrothermal vents with the Schmidt Ocean Institute. We are so excited to have classrooms from all over the glo globe joining us as we explore um, the research vessel, Fal research vessel Falcor and the hydrothermal vents. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. We love participation from everyone watching, and there are two different ways to ask questions. First, if you are watching on Google+, um, we are turning on the Q&A app. That will pop up right on the side of your Hangout screen. You can just ask questions right there. And if anyone else has the same question as you, go ahead and give that a plus one. If you are watching on our website, um, there is a Google form directly under the YouTube viewing window where you can ask questions. You can go ahead and start asking questions right now. Um, we have time to answer those throughout the presentation as well as some extra time set aside at the end. So as soon as you have questions, go ahead and send those in. Um, as we get started today, I want to introduce you to everyone we have joining us live. First, in Santa Cruz, California, we have Miss Daniel's classroom. They are joining us. Everybody say hi. Hello. And hi. all right. And um, from the Pacific Ocean, we have live on the research special Falcor. We have Jesse and Colleen. Jessie is studying the animals found um, deep underwater. She uses a high-pressure system on board the ship to keep these animals in conditions similar to what they see in their natural habitat. And Colleen is the lead marine technician on the ship, so she deals with making sure the scientists and the captain and the crew of the ship are all talking to each other. Um, these ladies, along with about 20 other people, have been living aboard this research vessel for the past few weeks as they conduct research using remotely operated vehicles deep in the Pacific Ocean. So I'm going to hand it over to you ladies. Go ahead and get started and tell us a little bit about what it's like to live on the ship. All right. Good morning, everybody from the South Pacific Ocean. So we're here on the Falcor uh, conducting some research in the vent fields, as Ali mentioned. Um, but first, we'll give you a little bit about you know what it's like to live on board. I know I can't really see anybody except for the one classroom, but by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been on a boat before? <laughs> All right, excellent. How many of you have been on a ship? Does anybody know the difference between a boat and a ship? Are we well, the general rule, the general rule of thumb is that a boat goes on a ship. So uh, this is the good ship Falcor. Does anybody know where the name Falcor came from? Shout it out if you know. Shout it. Oh, never never ending story. story. Yeah, that's correct. Very good. So the Falcor is the character, the Luck Dragon in the never-ending story. It was named from the book, not the movie. Uh, and we think that the name really holds true. The Falcor, the ship itself, has been really good to us in the years that we've been operating. So this ship wasn't originally a research vessel. It was actually used for something completely different, which was to patrol the German coast. And the ship was acquired in 2009, and it took three years in a shipyard in northern Germany to actually convert the ship into a purpose-built research vessel. So I joined the ship in Germany back in 2012 when we were still in the shipyard and getting everything set up. So when I got here, there was no science equipment. So we had to get it, install it, and make it all work. So it was a very busy first year that we started sailing. So we've been operational now for four years. So things are a lot smoother. So we have a lot of different technology on board. We have a bunch of different scientific equipment, like sonars to map the seafloor. And right now, we have the remotely oper operated vehicle 
Ropos. So you can't see the vehicle itself, but you can see behind me the control room, uh, what that looks like. That's where they are operating it, and we will go in and say hello to everybody in a little bit. So behind me also is just on these screens, this is a really cool technology that we have called the digital matrix, and this allows us to configure all of the screens that you'll see here in the control room for whichever kind of operation we're doing. So we're not always doing remotely operated vehicle dives. Sometimes we're doing oceanography cruises where we have other sensor packages that we put over the side and measure the water column. We also will do mammal, marine mammal observations and we will map the seafloor. Sometimes we have dedicated cruises for each of these different things and sometimes we try to do them all at once. So this one we're focusing just on the dives and on seafloor mapping. So that makes it a little bit easier. But living on a boat is very, uh, or a ship, is uh, very difficult for some people. It, some people, it just comes naturally. Um, but the ship's crew, most of us have been doing it for a long time. I've been working on ships for about 15 years now. This is the 14th ship that I've actually worked on. And the crew is about 22 to 24 people, and then scientists and the remotely operated vehicle crew are about 18 people. So it's quite a few people to fit in a relatively small space. So imagine you had your classroom here. Uh, all you guys were hanging out in the, in the school for a month at a time without going home. What do you think? Would that be fun? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so at least we have a nice view of the water, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, it can be really challenging, especially when the ship's moving a lot um, and being far away from home, but it's something that a lot of the crew are quite used to, and nowadays it's a lot easier. As you can see, the technology we're using to talk to you guys, we can also use this to talk to our friends and family at home and keep in touch with everybody a lot more easily, so that makes it a little less hard. Um, but we're going to, I'm going to pass it over to Jessie and she's going to tell you a lot more about the science that we're doing. Uh, but what you can see behind me on the screen, this is the live ROV video, which is also streaming to YouTube right now. So anybody can watch this online. And then we have the science control room, which we'll take you into in a little bit. And then also, <clears throat> this is a map of where we're working. So you can see the ship here. And then the ROV. Right now the ROV is pretty much hanging out in one spot doing a, a survey of this vent that you see here on the video screen. So we're going to let Jesse talk about the science and then we'll be giving you guys a short tour afterwards. Hi guys, how are you guys doing? So I'm a, <laughs> I am a graduate student at, uh, in the Gurkis lab at Harvard University and uh, I'm here studying the symbiotic bacteria that lives in the animals that live at the hydrothermal vents. And um, we're scientists are really excited about this ecosystem, these ecosystems at hydrothermal vents because they are pretty much like no other ecosystem um, that we're used to thinking about, um, such as forests or you know, the shallow waters in the ocean. Um, because all of those ecosystems are uh, dependent on energy from the sun and in the hydrothermal vents the energy comes from chemicals and 40 years ago we didn't even uh, know that this was possible and the ecosystem could thrive just based on chemical energy um, so in 40 years since we've discovered the hydrothermal vents there's been a lot of energy invested into learning about this and that's what I do and the reason I study the bacteria that are living inside the animals is because the animals um, depend on this bacteria to make that chemical energy. So um, have you guys ever heard of the good bacteria that live in the yogurt that you eat or your gut bacteria? Yeah. It's kind of like that. Yeah. It's kind of like that, but these snails um, and mussels and tube worms that are at the hydrothermal vents, they don't even have to eat because their bacteria feeds them um, and all they need to do is, 
is uh, sit in the vent water. So it's a very, very, it's almost like studying aliens. So, um, do you guys have any questions about? Yeah? Speak up. I can hear it. Sitting in the sea vents, I was wondering, do the bacteria gather food or is it just them like cellular respiration? I'm sorry, I cannot, can you, can you say that louder? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so, wondering about, wondering about the bacteria, do they gather food and ever how do they gather food? Okay, so they do you guys have you guys learned about photosynthesis? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So these bacteria, they don't they don't gather food, they gather energy and they make food, I guess is and so they do have cellular respiration as well but they get their energy for cellular respiration um, from the chemicals. So instead of sunlight, they do chemosynthesis. So there's photosynthesis, and then there's chemosynthesis, and that's how they're doing it. Um, we also have a question coming in from our online forum, and I wanted to kind of jump in because some, cl some classrooms have asked why we can't see them on camera. Um, we only have room for one classroom on camera, but you can feed us all of your questions through that question form, and we'll be able to answer them for you. But one question was asking about the types of animals that you're seeing down there, and I think they're not really like any animals that we would see at the surface of the ocean, correct? Yes and no. So a lot of the animals that we see in the Lao Basin, they do look like animals that we see in inter in the tidal intertidal zones. Um, they look just like mussels and snails, and um, except these these mussels and snails, they don't have they have um, a reduced gut, and so they they do they're they're very strange in the fact that they rely on their bacteria. Um, to, to live and not, they do not have the regular life cycle of the snails and mussels that we see in shallower waters. Awesome, thank you. So we're going to start by giving you a little bit of a tour of the science spaces on the ship. So if everybody wants to start thinking about questions as we go along, we're going to come back into the library and actually stop and answer all of your questions when we are finished with the tour. So I just need to a minute to get set up with that and then we'll head out the door. Um, we have a couple questions that were kind of coming in. I don't know. What depth is the ROV at right now? Ooh, right now. 2,000 meters. 2,000 meters. Or approximately 2,000 meters. Okay. Um, and it asked if we could, if they can look on a map and see exactly where, where in the ocean it is. What like landmarks are you closest to, or what could they put in Google Maps to find the area? I think Ta Tonga would be the closest. Uh, if they use Google Earth, you can put it in Lao Basin. Okay, perfect. So that's something that everyone can do in their classrooms after this is over. Um, and right. share that on our website as well, where to look, so that they can get a sense of where in the Pacific you all are. So if you actually go to the Schmidt Ocean Institute webpage, www.schmidtocean.org, there is a status page uh, for the FALCOR that not only shows the ship's position, but also some of the current data coming from the ship. So the air temperature, the water temperature, the wind speed, things of that nature, you can see them plotted out on the current status data dashboard. Awesome. Thank you. Hillary, uh, your classroom had a question. Do you want to ask that question while we're transitioning to the tour? Uh, are the organisms that are down by the like the vents are they autotrophs or heterotrophs? Because they gain food from like their cells. 
That's a that's a great question. Um, so, I'm, I'm just going to get rid of that. Okay. So the the animals, such as the snails, they are heterotrophs, um, and the bacteria are autotrophs. So it's a combination of both, just like we have here, like on the, well, not here. This is we're on the ocean, but just like the the ecosystems you're used to with the with plants and gardens. So okay. So the, first, I think we should go to the control room. Ready? Yeah. Perfect. Ready for the tour. So we're we're gonna we're gonna head over to the control room where um, scientists as well as pilots. <coughs> oh wait, if you talk like this and your camera comes up? Yeah, there's every camera. Ooh, it, it's me. We can't hear them. We're having trouble hearing you guys at the moment. How about now? There we go. That works. That's perfect. And you can see us as well? Yes, we can. OK, excellent. Let's go. OK, so before I go in here, it's a little dark. And, uh, so we're going to have pilots um, that are controlling the ROV and scientists that are kind of working with the pilots and showing the pilots where they want to go and what they, what they want to do. So let's come on in and see what they're doing. Hello. How's it going? How are you guys doing? Uh, we're just flying around the tree looking for uh, sea light for smokers. <laughs> Black smokers at the uh, uh, hydrogen vent uh, venting hot fluid and gases and such things uh, down at sea level. Why is the smoke coming out black? Question for the side. Yeah. So that actually isn't smoke. It's um superheated fluid where the it, when it's bubbling up through the crust, it's um, kind of melting metals and the, uh, chemicals, and the metals and chemicals are precipitating out in fluid. Wow. Um, Thomas yeah. Jefferson High School is asking how close to the vents are you guys able to get? So that might be a good, this might be a good kind of part to talk about that as we're looking at these images. Uh, we got close enough last week that we melted plastic on the front of the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this right now, just for everyone that's watching, because we did get a question. So we are in the ROV control room, correct? So this is where... Um, you guys are actually controlling where the ROV is on the sea floor and how deep it is and what it's looking at. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. Um, and one school um, was wondering how is the ROV powered? Um, how does it stay powered down there deep under the sea? Tom, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, we have uh, three phase, 3,000 volts. Like it's a huge amount of voltage that goes down in a very low current, and then it turns a motor, which then uh, um, powers a hydraulic pump. So all our thrusters are hydraulic. So fluid going through uh, pipes that turn the yeah. turn the propellers to make the the sub move around. And then we have a bunch of electronics down there, and lots of cameras and lots of lights. So <laughs> hope that answers your question. That does. And we had another question. So as you were seeing, 
um, what you were saying isn't smoke. A lot of students are asking is, is it similar to lava, what we're looking at, that's coming sort of out of these vents? No, I would say that uh, it's mostly hot water, but the particles over time have built these giant 30 meter, 90, 90 foot, um, we call it chimneys, but really a, all it is is just a lot of sediment settling over time and hardening over time. So some of it's really hard and some of it's really soft, but uh, like that, to go in close, the black ones we call uh, beehives. They're super soft, black almost like charcoal, and if we touch them or we thrust it back too much and the wash hit it, it actually just disappeared into the, as if it was smoke. Wow. So there is lava activity, but it's all kind of down on the bottom, and it's kind of like big bubbles of lava. But there, I don't think anything's been active here for a long time, other than okay. the tiny of hot water. And a lot of students are asking, because hydrothermal vents are sort of a, a new concept for a lot of the students that are watching, so what um, what exactly are hydrothermal vents, and how are they, they created? Um, um, are there any scientists that has a clear answer? <laughs> so hydrothermal vents are uh, usually found either where the plates on the earth are either pulling apart or or pushing together and um, we are the back are, we're anyway but so the seawater cold seawater can come in through the crust and where the plates are pushing apart um, or pulling together they they the cold seawater gets the ah the plates percolates up through the hot um, magma and and comes out at the hydrothermal vents um, as hot fluid full of metals and sulfides. So, so essentially it's where at the, um, because we're so deep, it's closer to sort of like the core of the earth, um, so temperatures are a little different. It's not like the land we're standing on here. And a lot of students you may have heard of tectonic plates um, or plates moving, um, shifting, causing earthquakes. It's similar to, the, similar to those openings a little bit. Is that probably a good explanation? It, it is those openings. And actually, you know, when we discovered the hydrothermal vents, it was one of the kind of the nail uh, well, I would not say the coffin, but it it, it confirmed um, plate tectonic theory um, when the, the vents were discovered. Perfect. Um, and okay, a, oh, somebody right. asked if we know what the water temperature is around there. Around that's, the that's very very. Nice. The ambient temperature of the water is 2.4 degrees Celsius. Okay. The temperature in the vents can reach up to a couple hundred degrees. Okay. So that's why we're seeing those formations as that really cold water comes as that cold water comes in to that really really um, near those really really hot vents. Exactly. That's what that's what cools the superheated hydrothermal fluid down and causes the precipitation of the minerals which then builds the chimneys. Very cool. So we're going to take you outside, see what it's like. It's just after sunrise here, um, and show you what the what the deck of the ship looks like, and then we're going to go into another lab space. So we're going to follow Jesse. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thanks. <clears throat> so I think that's really interesting. There are a lot of computers being used down there, a lot of screens to control that one um, ROV. A lot of students commented on that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that need to be monitored during an ROV dive, like the navigation of the vessel, uh, the vehicle relative to the vessel, also uh, the depths of the vehicle, make sure we have enough of our cable paid out so that we're not tugging on the vehicle. So we're going to take you here on the back deck.
So this is the working deck. And this is where we deploy the vehicle. And so this is the cable where the vehicle is attached, hanging off the end of the ship. And when we bring it on board, we sit it on this platform right in the middle so the guys can reach the vehicle and do maintenance. Basically, in between dives, they need to check that everything is working correctly. And on some occasions, they might need to swap out some scientific sensors or sampling. And then all of the scientists come out on deck to take all of the samples that they've collected into the lab and start processing the samples. So we have a limited amount of sample processing that we can do on board. The ship itself cannot provide every single piece of lab equipment for every single type of experiment. So what happens is the scientists, like Jesse and her team, they'll bring a number of instrumentation with them and set up for their own particular experience, uh, experiments in our lab space. Anything that they can't do on the ship, they'll then take ashore and process when they get back to shore. So we're going to go into the wet lab now and show you where the science team works on processing samples. Perfect. In one classroom, um, Frenchtown Middle School asked, do you ever see any trash or pollution that far under the sea? Do you ever get any pollution in your samples? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, if we ever see pollution in samples that far under the ocean. <coughs> Not that I've seen, but, but we know so little about the hydrothermal vents. I think it would be hard to figure out whether uh, pollution right now is be affecting it. But I've heard that other um, deep sea environments we have been seeing an effect from ocean acidification. So. Very interesting. Um, so when the sub comes up, uh, scientists like myself rushed out to the sub and we bring, collect all the animals off the sub and bring them into here where we sort them and uh, we process them. In, in this lab, there's a lot of instruments. Um, us that study that look at uh, the gases in the vent water or microscopes to look at the animals. Um, we also have over here Hans, uh, Hansola's IGTs, and they actually keep uh, vent water at pressure, kind of like if you think of a soda can, but a lot more pressure, so um, it keeps all the gases in, so they don't escape when we bring them to this, bring them up to the seafloor. So we can analyze the gases as if they were down at the bottom of it. So. Wow! And so obviously the animals that you're studying are quite small. Um, you're not bringing up any, ex you know, large animals from the from the vent. Now, pretty much all our animals can fit into buckets. Very cool. Um, and someone asked if you guys have discovered any new organisms during your research. Maybe not on this trip, but during hydrothermal re vent research in general. I personally have not. Um, but uh, I think Chuck Fisher, who, uh, who is the lead scientist on this cruise, personally has two species named after him, so I think there's a, a lot of discoveries. Very cool. Yeah, because it's an area of the ocean that we haven't been able to get to until fairly recently um, because of how deep it is, so that's a, it's a, good, a good place to discover something new. Um, and Frenchtown yeah. Middle School is also asking, um, why do you think it's so important to study these hydrothermal vents? What are, what are the benefits of the type of research that you're doing? Well, there are a whole new ecosystem um, that we actually know, they're very, it's very hard to study them down here, um, so we know comparatively little about it compared to you know, a forest ecosystem. Um, furthermore, if we were to find you know, life on one of the moons uh, where 
there's not that much sun or there's a there's a um, one, of, one of Saturn's moons has you know an ice crust over it with a theoretical ocean underneath. Um, so there's been talk about there a possibility of hydrothermal vents there. Um, so and importance of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot for us to learn about the ocean still, and so, you know, this is one of those pieces that, that we, have to, we have to put together, because um, it all, we know that the ocean is so critical to our life here on Earth that learning as much about it as we can, I think, I think is, is really critical. So we're just going to wander back into the library and we'll, we'll be able to take your questions. And we're going to play a video for you of the other lab space. We have the pressure van, which is another workspace where we take uh, the samples into to keep them under pressure in their um, similar environment from where they came. Because that... Um, being that deep underwater is such a high pressure environment, so different from what we experience here on Earth. Like if you've ever dove really deep um, and kind of, you know, felt your ears pop as you come up or something like that, um, it's, a, it's a really high pressure environment. So we have to keep those animals in that same environment um, as we're studying them so that they stay, they stay healthy and we're able to see what they function like when they're really deep underwater. All right. Um, let's go, first of all, before we start that video, um, Miss Daniel's class, do you guys have a question for us? I saw some questions come in. Um, you're muted, Hillary. Just make sure you unmute. Sorry. Evan. Yeah. Uh, I heard that you guys, like, studied two worms down there. Like, is that true? You guys, like, yeah. Uh, well... It's funny that you asked because we were looking for two worms yesterday and we could not find them. So they're typically not found um, in the Lao Basin. Um, they're, the two worms um, are mostly in the East Pacific Rise um, and other, other vent sites, but they're not typical to this vent site. The major um, chemosynthetic animals at this vent site would be the the spiky snail, um, the Alvinaconca, and this other snail, Inframeria, and this this mussel. So those are those are the three major organisms. <laughs> Can we ask another? Wow. That's, yeah. Yeah. Go Great. for it. Um, how many different kinds of organisms are down there? How many different times of how many? How many? There's about 500 vent species. 500 vent species. Blue jack. And jack. Um, yeah. I have a question about the ROV. I imagine that the cable going down to the ROV that sends the electricity and the controls and tells it what to do, is that strong enough to support the ROV, or do you have a separate tether that also goes down to the ROV so that you can bring it back up with that or whatever? Oh. It's all one tether, and so there's a couple different ways that the remotely operated vehicles can be configured. There's a single body system and a dual body system. So with the dual body system, you put basically a weight at the end of the cable that just that sort of bounces up and down with the ship, and then you have a neutrally buoyant tether that goes from that, essentially a weight, but it can be another propelled vehicle. Um, that then goes to the ROV, and that allows the ROV to work undisturbed on the seafloor. The Ropos vehicle that we have on board right now, though, is a single body system, and instead of having that extra vehicle, what they do is they make the tether, the, the cable that connects to the vehicle, they make a section of it neutrally buoyant with these football-shaped floats. Um, and so they attach them just sort of behind the vehicle so that you know, the, as the cable's going up and down, as the ship's going up and down in the seas, the end of the cable that's closest to the ROV is not doing the same motion. So that sort of breaks that motion so that the ROV can continue to work 
as you saw in the control room, uh, relatively undisturbed from the ship. Wow, and we have a lot of questions coming in about the ROV, if I can just ask a couple more. Um, one question kind of along those lines was, how long does it take the ROV to get to the bottom, um, to get to the seafloor? That's a great question. Obviously, that's going to uh, be different based on the depth of the dive site. The ROV will travel around 25 meters a minute or so, and it also depends um, when we're coming up, how quickly it'll come up based on how much it's carrying. So how much rocks these guys <laughs> decide to bring up from the seafloor. So for a uh, about a 2,000 meter dive, it'd take about an hour and a half or so. Okay, so there's there's a lot there's a lot of kind of wait time before it gets down there. Um, and how That's large right. is it, and how much does it weigh approximately? So it's about this big. No, um, <laughs> it's uh, it's about it's a uh, roughly three and a half meters long and about two and a half three meters wide, and then uh, taller than the ceiling. So it's um, let's see, if it's about about two two and a half or three meters high as well. So each vehicle is kind of unique. Um, there's a lot of remotely operated vehicles used in the commercial industries, like the oil and gas industry. And, and they can be pretty standard, but the ones that are built for science are pretty much always customized, so they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So we've had a couple of different vehicles. Uh-oh, we just lost sound. Let's see here. We just lost sound. I don't know if we lost the mic. <laughs> can you hear us now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we've had a number of different vehicles over the years that take up uh, different spaces on the back deck, different configurations, and with different kinds of science equipment on board. Awesome. Do you want to roll into that video and then we can finish up with some more questions? Yeah, so Jesse's going to tell you about the pressure van, which is a supplement to our wet lab space. The video that Cherise. Uh, put together for me, who uh, is doing photo mosaicing on this cruise. Um, but so that's what the vehicle looks like. Yep, this is the vehicle on the deck. It's kind of like an overview of what happens after the after it comes up. Oh, actually, this is the big going down. <laughs> There's a, you can see, um, snails, oh, that's a scale worm, some shrimp, this is, a one of the things we use to kind of measure the chemistry in a defined area and around animals, and this is a, Literally us taking a Here comes the It's always exciting when it comes on deck. <laughs> <laughs> And there, there's are the animals. So these are the albinaconca snails that have the spikes. I like to think of them as like the little punk rockers, the deep sea. <laughs> so they really look sorry. all that different than snails on land, you know, that we see closer to the surface. Nope. Just with a cooler haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so, most of my work that I do on board the ship is towards the back um, in what is a sh modified shipping container. We, um, I built a lab. We built a high-pressure lab into the shipping container. 
and we're able to keep deep sea de uh, vent animals alive um, at pressure with um, and create kind of through bubbling gases for these columns we were able to create vent conditions in, in aquaria. So this is like a really fancy um, aquarium system. <laughs> wow. These are high pressure pumps. And this is us trying to bring in the animals up to pressure. And we're putting the animals in their home, their new home. And this is a great way, this is great because then we can adjust their conditions and then we can look at how they handle each condition. We look at their gene expression and all right, that's it. Thank you. Wow. That's that's really cool, and I thanks for taking us inside of um, that lab that I know you said you couldn't take us into, um, just walking in because it looks a a little small, um, and b like it doesn't get great Wi-Fi. So thanks for taking us in there. Um, as you were bringing up that, our, as we were watching the video of the ROV coming up, a couple other questions came in that asked about you know are you finding um, plants on the seafloor? Um, deep down there, are you bringing any anything like that up? Um, no, plants are not found on the seafloor. Um, plants need sunlight, and there is no sunlight that reaches the seafloor. Right. So it's all it's all just animals that are are living off of um, bacteria and things that are getting um, nutrients from minerals, that sort of thing. Yes, and Bacteria and microbes are the only things that can, I'm only organisms that can do chemosynthesis. So you're not going to find a snail that does chemosynthesis. You're going to find a snail that has the bacteria that does the chemosynthesis. So. Very cool. Um, and have, have you been able to grow this bacteria or culture it um, off ship, um, maybe back in labs mm -hmm. at Harvard, anything like that? A lot of people are trying. Um, the organisms that we work with right now, I, they are not um, cultured, but some of them are. Um, some other types. The, of it's very, it's very, it's very difficult to do. And uh, the more we learn about um, the the physiology and, and what the the snail is providing to the bacteria as a, as an environment um, inside them, the the more we're going to be able to culture them in the lab, so yeah. that that would that is one of our goals. Very interesting, I, because I know our conditions um, on land are so different than what they're experiencing on the sea floor. Um, another question was: so these are the ROV that you're sending down. Is it taking a 360 degree video the whole time, or does it have just a, a small range of view? What are what's it looking at generally? You want to answer this question? So it depends on the configuration of the vehicle, and right now the cameras are not set up to take a 360 view, you know, in the window of the camera. Um, but they are surveying the vents by going all the way around them and photo mosaicing them. So they will get sort of a 3D sort of perspective on them. Um, and on our previous expedition. We did do a 3D view. You can see that on our YouTube channel on the virtual vents uh, site. There's an actual video on there where you can load it on your tablet or mobile device, and you literally hold it up and move the tablet around to actually move around the vent. So it's something that is done, but is not the focus of this project. And um, this this time, it looks like you guys are only operating this one ROV. Have you ever operated more than one at a time, or is this sort of a deal where you send down one at a time? Yeah, you would never send down more than one vehicle at a time uh, attached to the cable. There might be a case where you might deploy a glider or AUV, which is not attached to the vehicle at the same time as the ROV. But you really would be quite limited to have many things dangling beneath the ship on a cable uh, where 
what the officers need to do when they're driving the ship is they need to keep it very steady so we don't run over the cable. Um, it is literally the lifeline for the vehicle. So to do that with multiple vehicles would be very challenging. It would be a risk that we wouldn't want to take with such an expensive piece of equipment. <laughs> yes, definitely. And we had a couple questions about um, just living on the ship. So how long for this um, <clears throat> This cruise, are you all going to be on the ship together? And how long have you already been out? So this cruise is a, is about a month long. It's about 28 days total. But we did have about a 36-hour port call in between in Tonga to switch out a few folks. Uh, that's kind of an average length expedition for us. The crew uh, are on the ship for two to three months at a time, working seven days a week. So even when we're in port, we're still working. Even when it's Sunday, we're still working. And the scientists will join us for their particular cruise, however long that expedition might be. So it could be 10 days, 2 weeks, or the longest I've done is 37 days. And the longest the ship has done was a 40-day expedition mapping Tamu Massif, which is the world's largest underwater volcano. So it kind of depends on the project how long it is, but the crew will be here for several months at a time uh, working, and then we'll go home and be not working. So <laughs> that's that's really the big you know, pro and con to this kind of lifestyle um, is to have a lot of time off when you are home. Yeah, and um, someone else asked from Thomerson, Thomas Jefferson High School, they said that you probably don't keep a normal schedule when you're on the ship, so... What does your schedule kind of look like? How long, you know, are you working? Are you working during the daylight hours, nighttime hours? What does that look like? Absolutely. Well, we have a couple of different departments on the ship. The first is the deck department, and they literally drive the boat and also make sure to maintain all of the deck equipment, so making sure that um, the ship is um, looking nice and also all of the equipment is performing well like our cranes and the A-frame and that's, that sort of stuff, and our boats. Then we have the engine department, and they maintain what, what, it, what you would guess, you know, the engines. And that's what gets us to where we have to go. It's what gives us the lights, gives us the power for our satellite connection to talk to you guys. And then we have the interior department, which is a lot of people's favorite department, the food, right? The food is excellent on this ship. We have some really really skilled chefs, um, and also maintaining all of the interior spaces on the ship. And then we have my department, which is the science department, and we support all the scientific operations. So we have a lot of science equipment on board that um, is ins regularly installed on the ship, plus whatever the science party will bring with them. So when we're conducting 24-hour operations, which is most of the time when we're underway, each of these departments will be working quite different hours because you always need somebody to drive the ship, right? And then you al always need somebody to make sure that the engines are running. So the chefs and the interior department, they work more or less a, a day shift. The engineers and the deckhands are kind of split into watch groups, so a number of them will be working a relatively day shift, but then you have the folks working overnight to make sure that not only we're going in the right direction, getting where we need to go, but also that everything is, is working and safe. They have to do rounds to make sure we don't have any you know, accidents or emergencies. And then the science party works around the clock. You know, It really is focused on the operations. So when the ROV is in the water, somebody is doing the logging, making sure that you know, the pilot is going where they need them to go and collecting the samples they need. And then when it comes on deck, the work doesn't stop. They have to collect the samples and start processing right away. So it's just an absolute around-the-clock mission here most of the time. Yeah, and a lot of it's, you know, it sounds like a, a really interesting lifestyle. And a lot of people are actually said they couldn't believe that this is a job. They just were asking, is this something you just do for fun? Because it does seem really cool and interesting. Um, so I know that you ladies um, are doing this as a job. And what is your background? Like, what have you done in school that has allowed you to, to have these opportunities and to do research on a vessel like this? Yeah, it definitely is a rather exciting job. And uh, although it would be neat to not have to work, I do need to get a paycheck. I do own a house and 
need to pay the bank, but um, I went to Maine Maritime Academy and studied marine science and small vessel operations. So that put me in a really good position to be the liaison between the science group and the ship's crew um, because I studied science and basically driving boats. So I really helped them with the communication to make sure that they get to where they got to go and can get their operations done safely and efficiently and then manage all the data that we collect on board. And I will let Jesse answer about her background. Um, I, my background was uh, ecology and undergrad, and now I'm shifting. And, and uh, for my graduate school, I'm shifting my focus into microbiology and uh, the vent environment. So that's, that's how I ended up here. Um, and I believe, like the ROV pilots, a lot of them have um, backgrounds in engineering and robotics. And so there's a lot of um, people with different backgrounds here, and there's a lot of pathways that can get you out into the middle of the ocean. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that there are lots of different ways that you can get out, and you even talked about you have cooks on on the ship and that sort of thing. So there are lots of different jobs that can get people out. Um, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, Hillary, does your class have any last questions that they want to ask before we wrap up? We can take one question. Yes. So, don't we know more about the food than we know about the What did you say? We know more about what? Do, do we know more about the moon than the ocean? More about the moon than the ocean. Yeah, that is unfortunately kind of true. Um, I think that a lot of people don't really realize how much of the ocean is still unexplored. Um, there's quite a lot for us to do, and it's really difficult to cover all of this ground because it is quite expensive um, and quite uh, time-consuming to make plans to get ships in different parts of the world, especially out here. It's a very remote location for us to be in. So it can be very challenging to get the funding that we need to conduct these kinds of projects to really get out there and explore. But there is plenty of work to be done in the oceans for sure. Definitely. And I think um, I think that's a great note to end on. You know, there's a lot that we can still learn about our oceans. And our oceans are so integral to all of us living here um, on Earth. You know, they help provide a lot of the oxygen that we breathe. A lot of our food comes from the oceans. Um, you know, there there is medical research that, you know, medical um, breakthroughs that can come from the oceans. And so it's incredibly important for us to not only support that research, but to protect the oceans every day. And so that's a great place for us to kind of point people to our resources um, at earthecho.org. We have lots of ways for you to protect the oceans. This year we are um, finishing up a tree planting campaign. So if you plant a tree and tell us about it on our website, um, if you host a tree planting and tell us about it, you can win a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one Google Hangout with Philippe Cousteau and tell him about the work and talk to him about his work in saving the oceans. But I wanted to say thank you so much to um, you guys for hosting us on the, um, on the FALCOR today and to Schmidt Ocean Institute for helping to set this up. Um, and also to Miss Daniels' classroom in Santa Cruz, California for joining us. And for everyone that tuned in and watched, I know we have a lot of questions that we didn't get to. Um, I'm going to be sharing those with Schmidt. I know some of them can be used maybe for future blog posts on the cruise. That's what we did last time. And if you have a really specific question, um, just submit your email address through that, quest, through that Google form, and that way we can get back to you and answer some of those more specific questions. So thank you so much, ladies, for helping us, for hosting us today. This was an awesome virtual field trip, and thanks for taking us um, into the Pacific. Great. Thanks so much for visiting, everyone. Thanks.